So I will get started. Hello and welcome to this panel event, working with incarcerated women in the context of COVID-19. My name is Sarah Bartley and I'm a lecturer in performance in the Department of Film, Theatre and Television at the University of Reading and a member of the AHRC funded research project, Women Theatre Justice. I will be hosting today's event and along with my colleague, Professor Kiva Makovinci, will be um, who will be introducing the research project that this seminar is part of and chairing the Q&A in the second section of the event. And we are also being supported by the technical wizardry of our colleague, Professor Anne-Marie Green, who will be admitting folks and supporting with the breakout rooms today. Um, so to turn to the event, um, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed a myriad of healthcare, human rights and education, rehabilitation and capacity issues within the UK criminal justice system. And this event brings together speakers from criminal justice, arts and culture, and the women's sector to reflect on how the coronavirus has impacted the lives of incarcerated women and those encountering the criminal justice system at this time. And we're really excited to be joined by such an incredible lineup of speakers who I will introduce in a moment. But first, um, some Zoom housekeeping. So we are recording today's event and we'll be disseminating it on our project website in the coming weeks. So please let me, Sarah Bartley, know via email if you appear in the Zoom but don't wish to appear in the recording of today's event. And you can find my email on invitations to the event. Um, as I've said, uh, please keep your microphones on mute unless you are speaking. Um, and there will be moments for conversation and group reflections after we've heard from our panel. If you inadvertently leave the Zoom, please don't worry, just click on the link again and we'll readmit you into the space. Uh, so a little bit of an overview of our programme. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to the Women Theatre Justice Project from Professor Kiva Makovinci. And this will be followed by three talks that outline the landscape of working with incarcerated women during the pandemic. We will hear from Emma Tor from Appeal, Kate Paradine from Women in Prison and Paula Harriet from the Prison Reform Trust. This will be followed by a short small group conversation in breakout rooms and then a collective conversation all together with our speakers. And then we'll have a brief comfort break. In the second part of today's session, we will hear from Anna Herman, Yasmin Joseph and River about the work of Clean Break Theatre Company during this period. This will be followed by performance sharing, um, which has been uh, sort of drawn from the work that Yasmin and River have been doing as part of the Two Metres Apart project. And then we'll open out to a kind of broader Q&A session that will be chaired by Kiva Makovinci. So I'm sure questions will pop into your head as we go, uh, and we'd really encourage you to sort of pop them into the, Q uh, into the chat section. And um, so they're ready for the Q&A uh, for the event. So if you could put Q&A in front of anything that is a question rather than a comment, that would really help us kind of gather those questions as we go. Um, we have excellent PhD researcher, Chloe Duan from the Department of Film, Theatre and Television here at Reading, live tweeting the event for us today. But if you want to contribute to the conversation on Twitter, please use the handle at WTJ Research um, and we'll be able to find and sort of emanate your tweet. I want now to turn to our speakers for today and introduce them. So I'm going to introduce those speaking in the first half of the session now, and then those speaking in the second half of the session after the break. Um, okay, so Professor Kiva Makovinci is a reader in socially engaged and contemporary performance at Queen Mary University of London. Prior, prior to this, she established the MA Applied Drama, Theatre and Educational Community and Social Contexts at Goldsmiths, University of London. She is author of, among other things, Theatre and Prison, oh, Theatre and Prison, and Performance and Community, Case Studies and Commentary, and more recently, Applied Theatre, Women and the Criminal Justice System. Emma Tor is Appeal's in-house practicing barrister 
Her primary role is representing clients who have suffered miscarriages of justice, working closely with appeals specialist investigators to uncover fresh evidence and overturn convictions through the CCRC and ultimately the Court of Appeal. Emma also supervises the Innocence Project and Women's Justice Initiative screening projects. Prior to joining Appeal in 2020, Emma worked for 15 years as a criminal defence barrister. Her practice included representing clients charged with offences offenses such as drugs, import, drug, and drug importation, firearms, fraud, sexual offences, serious violence and murder. Emma previously practiced at One Pump Court Chambers before moving in-house to work in a specialist firm of criminal defence lawyers. Dr. Kate Paradine is Chief Executive of Women in Prison, a national charity that delivers support for women affected by the criminal justice system in prisons, in the community, and through their women's centres. Kate has led various change initiatives in the public and charity sectors on issues including domestic abuse, child abuse, harmful substance use, mental ill health, and mental ill health, including publishing on national policy and strategy documents. She led the project to transfer staff and services from the National Policing Improvement Agency to the College of Policing and was previously National Quality Lead at CRI and lecturer in the Faculty of Law at the University of Southampton. Kate has been Chair of Trustees for a group of women's refuges and is trustee for the National Theatre Company Clean, Clean Break. And finally, Paula Harriet is Head of Prisoner Engagement at the Prison Reform Trust. She was previously head of involvement at Revolving Doors Agency 2015 to 2017, where she provided consultancy to two big lottery programs on service user involvement, as well as supporting the active involvement of the lived experience team in the National Liaison and Diversion Service. As head of programs at User Voice 2010 to 2015, she led on development of service user involvement in prison and probation, as well as forensic mental health services. She's a steering group member of Agenda and the coalition that seeks to support women and girls at risk and is a passionate advocate for highlighting the inequalities that affect vulnerable people in the criminal justice system and a trustee of the Community Chaplaincy Association. Her passion for working with excluded members of the community stems from her personal experience as a prisoner, 2004 to 2012. Her personal experiences and associated research sharpened her commitment to raising awareness of issues faced by prisoners and to campaign and protect, proactively deliver services which support both prisoners and ex-offenders to progress personally and strategically past the stigma of imprisonment and multiple exclusion. So they are the speakers that we're going to hear from, from in the first half of this, this afternoon's session. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Kiva Macavinci. Um, and I, as I do that, I'd really recommend that you move to speak of you so that you get the, the full experience of our panel of speakers um, as they, they share with you. And, and just a reminder, if you could please put yourself on mute, um, although you're more than welcome to, to share your image, your face with us as, as our speakers are talking. Um, so Kiva, I'm going to pass over to you to introduce the Women Theatre Justice Project. Thank you, Sarah. Um... It's such a pleasure to be here and to uh, to see so many other people in the room. Uh, and I'm just going to say a little bit about the Women Theatre Justice Project. So it's the umbrella title for the research and public engagement activities that are part of a research project called Clean Break, Women Theatre Organisation and the Criminal Justice System. Big title, big project. Um, and it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and it's a two-year project that we're that we're, so we're halfway through. It started in September of last year and it's due to run to September of next year. Um, and the project also supported by Women in Prison and the National Criminal Justice Arts Alliance. So within the project there are kind of two strands. One is sort of a deep dive into the work of Clean Break and the other is sort of a, an opening out and really trying to engage with as many different people as possible and thinking about um, theatre practices with women affected by the criminal justice system not only in the UK but also internationally as well. Um, within the project uh, there are kind of two disciplinary areas of research. So we are looking at, from a work and employment relations point of view, our colleagues Anne-Marie Green, who's at Leicester, 
and Deborah Dean, who's at Warwick. And then Sarah and I are both coming from a theatre and performance point of view. So the four of us are academics with very different backgrounds and absolutely working alongside each other and with Clean Break. And together, uh, we are examining four decades of Clean Break's work um, within the socio-political and economic landscape of arts policy and criminal justice policy in the UK since 1979. But in summary, we're really thinking about what Clean Break does, how they do it, and why they do it. And together, over the two years um, of um, carrying out lots of interviews with current staff and members and past staff and members, and also thinking about other artists who have been engaged with over this 40 year period of time. Uh, we're doing lots of observations of meetings and performances and events. Um, and certainly everything has changed in March where because of COVID and because of online, we actually had a much more and deeper and sustained observation of the organization and its practices at a point of crisis. Um, so there's interviews, observations, and also the third area is to do with archival research. So if anybody here was at the extraordinary launch of the Clean Break Archive at Bishopsgate last Thursday, you'll have a hint of the incredible kind of treasures that are there. So we've been looking at that work and we're also thinking about how this research engages with it and shares it. So that's kind of the project in terms of the deep dive into Clean Break. But really importantly, as we all know, that Clean Break's work and the women that it works with, it isn't in a bubble. And we are absolutely engaging in the wider socio-political uh, socio and cultural context of women's experience of the criminal justice system. And so therefore, this kind of small team is working and collaborating with colleagues across seven other universities from law, sociology, criminology, English literature and theatre, um, uh, from Sheffield, York St John, Manchester, Sussex, uh, Leeds and Oxford uh, and Wolverhampton. And so together, like, like what's happening today at Reading, so each of our colleagues at the different uh, universities is um, hosting uh, a seminar there which calls upon their expertise and kind of local expertise so together we can um, understand more about the contexts. I think the other thing for us in terms of it's very easy for research sometimes to get funneled into publications that may not have a wider public readership and a key part of what we want to do is to have conversations very publicly and to share them with others. So as well as the seminars that are happening, a key part of the work for us is the Women Theatre Justice website. So that's holding sort of documentation about the research as it progresses. But we also are looking at that as kind of a living responsive site that um, holds information about the events, has lots of regular blogs and links to other organisations as well. So that's sort of in summary what we're up to and as I hear myself say that I think two years is a very short amount of time to do all of that but we're trying um, and I look forward to hearing your questions uh, and talking with you later. Brilliant, thank you so much for that uh, that rich summary uh, Kiva um, it's lovely to, to, to just shape and, and, and frame the conversation that we're having today. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Emma Tor from Appeal who is, is, is going to be speaking and sharing with us from their perspective. So Emma, I know you have some slides to share. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kiva, um, for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to have been asked to uh, join you this afternoon. Um, I'm a barrister and I work at Appeal. Um, we are a charity law practice that represents individuals who have been wrongly convicted or unfairly sentenced. And in relation to women in particular, we have a dedicated women's justice initiative uh, program, uh, which represents uh, women who have been, there we go, try and get the slides to work. Uh, women who have been uh, imprisoned for minor non-violent offenses, women who've been sent to prison instead of being given the help that they need at a psychiatric hospital. Women who are victims or who were victims of domestic abuse, where this was relevant to the offence, but not raised in court. 
and innocent women prisoners, especially those whose crime was in fact accidental, the result of natural causes, or in fact never happened. Uh, we believe that many women in prison do not need to be there. You'll see from some of the statistics on the screen that 82% of women's prison sentences were for non-violent offences. And in 2018, 43% of women entering prison did so on remand, uh, and less than half of those resulted in prison sentences. In 2018, 77% of prison sentences given to women were for less than 12 months. Women in prison are also a highly vulnerable group and nearly 60% of women who have been assessed in prison have suffered from some form of domestic abuse. going forwards. COVID-19 has of course directly impacted the work that we do with our female clients uh, and there are three key areas where uh, this has affected uh, the work that we do. Firstly, accessing legal representation, accessing a fair hearing and accessing records. We represent uh, a small number of uh, women who are facing uh, long periods in custody. They are appealing their sentences or their convictions. And of course, the impact of COVID meant that legal visits were no longer possible. Uh, prisons, we believe, were slow in setting up the technology to allow visits with legal representatives to take place even though work has been done to set up that system, in practice, the organization and, and booking of video link appointments is not straightforward. Every prison appears to have a, a different system for booking legal visits, a different phone number or a different email procedure. The approach is inconsistent. Where appointments can be made, Often technology gets in the way of having effective communications with your client. Either the link goes down or in fact visits are cancelled altogether without the prisoner being able to access a lawyer. It may be months then until they have another opportunity to speak with their barrister or solicitor. We found that availability of online prison visits, it is very, very, uh, was severely reduced uh, across all female prisons. Um, it's often the case, for example, that perhaps the prison only has two video link booths across the whole prison population. Uh, and of course, with a number of female prisoners wanting to get in touch uh, and talk to their lawyers, there's often huge waits before they're able to, to speak to somebody. This means, of course, that whilst they are incarcerated and they're unable to access their lawyers, it also means that they are unable to access justice. We know that there have been severe backlogs in the court prison system, and there has been much in the press about the magistrates and Crown Court's backlog at the moment. Um, but of course, our work is uh, with women who have already been convicted uh, and the delays here are similar. There are delays to accessing hearings in the Court of Appeal. Uh, anecdotally, it's around perhaps 12 months from when a convicted prisoner wishes to appeal against their conviction or sentence to when they actually may receive a hearing in the Court of Appeal. Uh, we know from research that was conducted by the Griffins uh, Society that uh, women are less likely uh, to appeal their convictions or sentences. And there is a small proportion of women, in fact, um, who actually are successful in, in making appeals. 
if there are excessive backlogs in receiving access to justice, then women, of course, are less likely, we believe, to challenge those sentences or those convictions. Part of our work involves collecting material, searching for fresh evidence so that women who have been incarcerated can properly um, present an appeal either to the Court of Appeal or to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, a lot of our time is taken up um, making subject access requests, freedom of information requests to public bodies such as the CPS, the police, prisons and the probation service. Uh, however, it's our experience that due to the coronavirus pandemic, those public bodies have not been responding to our requests for information within the statutory time limits. Uh, all too often we receive a COVID excuse, which is that, sorry, we're unable to deal with your request because we're understaffed, our staff aren't in the office, and therefore we can't provide you that information. So women prisoners are clearly prevented from getting access to evidence and material to support their appeals. Before deciding on, on these, the way in which I was going to tackle the talk this afternoon, I felt that it was important to speak to our women prisons um, who we often speak to on the telephone on a regular basis to find out what their personal experiences of COVID were. Uh, and one client in particular, whose name I won't mention, uh, made a recording for me, which unfortunately, for legal reasons, I can't share with you today. But I've uh, included an extract of her recording. Uh, and she told me that the situation due to COVID has added many challenges. Uh, whilst she has been in isolation, her mental health has been seriously affected. She told me that she had had the virus herself and that the whole experience had been soul destroying. The truth is that you can't help but feel that us prisoners are at the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to lives being important. We are 100% reliant on staff for everything, but feel very neglected by them. The people who never neglect us are the very people we are being kept away from. It's part of a, as I said, a, a very moving recording and it highlights in our view, the damaging experience that women in prison have had during COVID, not only uh, been prevented from having access with their legal representatives, but also from their family and their friends. Uh, I'm sure that Kate and, and Paula will talk about this more in a moment, but the structure it isn't, the infrastructure simply isn't there for female prisoners to have regular face to face contact um, over purple visits with their family and their friends. And of course, this has a devastating impact on mental health of women in prison. We've highlighted a number of the, the side effects that we believe COVID-19 has had on our work in the criminal justice system. Uh, and we believe that there will be uh, an increase in poverty as a result of the furlough scheme as a result of the unemployment and the financial strain that, that people have had to endure in the last year. There will certainly be more convictions and therefore more prison sentences for women committing inquisitorial offences. These are offences such as theft, low level offending, but for people with previous convictions will often result in a prison sentence. There is a risk of incarceration for non-payment of council tax and TV license. And a statistic that we obtained from the Citizens Advice Bureau recently um, was that there are 1.3 million households which have fallen behind on council tax due to coronavirus. So we expect some of those to be before the courts and a large proportion of those uh, offenders will be women who will find themselves imprisoned for, for what are effectively debt offences. We know, um, we've heard all about the case backlog, but 
we've heard what it is today. There was a, a recent advisory report published uh, a month ago, uh, which modelled the number of cases we have now and where we could get to. Uh, and they estimate that by 2024, there may be as many 200,000 cases awaiting to be heard in the criminal justice system. This has a, a knock-on effect for women in prison, women who are on remand, who simply can't wait or can't face waiting years for a trial date. We believe therefore that there may be a risk of innocent people pleading guilty because they don't wish to be held in prison for a, a term which would be longer than the sentence they may receive if convicted. We have put together um, some resources on our website uh, which refer to the steps that we believe we should be taking as lawyers and as individuals uh, in relation to supporting women in prison at this time. Uh, we've set out some uh, information about COVID-19 and prisons and also uh, perhaps more importantly, some template letters. If you are concerned about uh, anyone in prison um, during the, co the coronavirus pandemic, we have template letters um, to send, but also letters for other lawyers um, who are advising people in custody uh, at this particular time. We'd uh, appreciate anyone who is interested in this subject to look at our website. There are more resources available there. Uh, and by all means, email me directly. Uh, my email address is on this screen uh, and let me know your thoughts and whether or not you have any personal experiences that you wish to share. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Emma. And as you say, um, we've heard uh, we've heard quite a bit about the, the sort of, oh, there's been a lot of media coverage around um, the backlog in cases in, in the system at the minute, but actually hearing some of that really granular detail um, and understanding the ways in which um, appeal are, are kind of trying to navigate that is, is, re is really excellent. So thank you for sharing that with us this afternoon. Um, I'm now gonna ask Kate Paradine to share um, her perspective from, um, from women in prison. So I'm gonna hand straight over to you, Kate, if that's okay. Hi everyone, thanks ever so much for inviting me, really appreciate it. I'm not sure if I misheard or whether I had an out of date bio, which may well be my poor administration, but I used to be a trustee of a brilliant clean break, but not anymore, um, but really pleased to be invited to this event. Thanks ever so much. Um, I'm sorry if my glasses are a bit yeah, distracting. Really, really. Okay, I'm not echoing, am I? Great. OK, so I was asked to speak about what women in prison are doing at the moment um, in relation to supporting women in prison, which I will do really briefly. And then I want to talk a bit about what we're doing more strategically around our campaigning and changing the whole system. So women in prison at the moment provide um, support services in communities in three women's centres in Manchester, Woking and London and provide services in prisons also. And we campaign for a radical reduction in the women's prison population. And Emma has set out some of the reasons why we desperately need to reduce the women's prison population. Emma's spoken about how many women are in prison for non-violent offences. Um, but also there are many women in prison for serious offences who shouldn't actually be there. We often know that there's a connection with domestic abuse when women are imprisoned and the campaign group Genva, Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, published a report last week about women imprisoned under joint enterprise laws, which I really commend everyone on this call to take a look at. And um, so it's a really complex picture about women's prisons, but what we know is that only a tiny number of women um, could possibly need to be incarcerated in a new system of justice. And that's the one that we argue for and campaign for. So in the last six months, we've been providing support in communities and in prisons as far as, far as we've been able. And Emma has um, given a, a quote there about um, 
how neglected women are by the very services that they need because those services aren't able to access those women. And that is something which we've been campaigning on relentlessly since the COVID-19 pandemic began, including really practical measures around opening up phone lines um, to women that are in prison to enable them to be in touch with their support workers. Even this simple um, issue is terribly difficult to resolve in the current prison system. We've got to remember that prisons are there primarily to punish and much as people make the best of imprisonment whenever they can, generally they make bad situations worse. And the situation within prisons, as I know Paula will tell you about what PRT are seeing on the ground for both women and men, is the impact on mental health, the isolation of being often 23 hours in a cell with no access to the sort of social engagement that you might have that's limited already in prisons. Children not able to see parents now since the beginning in many cases of the pandemic. Mothers separated from children, often very young children. Um, we've campaigned with um, birth companions for pregnant women and mothers and babies to be released from prison um, and to serve out the rest of their sentence in the community. Um, but that in, in itself has been a terribly difficult um, campaign because um, it isn't the case that all pregnant women and mothers and babies have been able to do that. And that shows how difficult it is to bring change about. And so our services, what our services have been seeing is when we've been meeting women through the gate, it is not unusual still and hasn't been unusual for the last six months to have women released homeless. Um, my staff at Women in Prison, um, regularly we hear stories and they experience the difficulties of women finding housing when they're released homeless. And so this is an issue which has continued despite the promises we were given at the beginning of the pandemic. Issues around poverty are exacerbated, as we know, especially for women who have suffered disproportionately under the pandemic. Domestic abuse, mental health, we're seeing the impact on these gradually becoming worse and worse as the months have gone on. And the situation we're facing as a team in women in prison is issues around safeguarding. And sadly, we are seeing um, women die in the community, including by suicide. And this is something that we are really concerned about in terms of what this means going forward as the months go on. So those are the practical issues that we're facing. In terms of campaigning, we've been campaigning with birth companions and with other um, independent charities, Appeal, um, Prisoner Advice Service. So many charities have been campaigning so hard for a focus on those in prison and a need to take advantage of this time now to look at the reduction of the prison population and what we can do to limit the harm on those in prison of this pandemic. And unfortunately, we have not made the progress that we would have liked. So it's very much a focus of ours to continue that, that attention in the lead up to Christmas in particular. Usually Christmas is a time when prison governors focus on those individuals within prison who can be released on temporary license with the pressure on prisons um, removed and people to be with their families, in some cases working um, and rebuilding their lives in advance of release. This alone is gonna be very limited in these weeks. And we are asking prison governors and ministers to focus on what can be done to reduce the prison population in the lead up to Christmas um, and beyond. Because actually now should be the time when we draw attention to the fact that many of those in prison can be realistically serving sentences in the community um, and we should be looking at how we can make that happen. What we shouldn't be doing is continuing um, with plans to build new prisons which are not needed and will only increase the problem that we face as a country in terms of breaking records in terms of the numbers of people including women that we imprison. Um, so that's where we are in terms of our campaigning. Um, so the third area um, that we have been really focused on, as we always are, is on systems change. So I did want to speak to you uh, for my last few minutes. And Sarah, have I got five minutes left? I don't want to go over your time. So the last five minutes, I wanted to speak about what we've been doing in relation to systems change, because we believe a whole new system of justice is possible. Um, the great Dr. Zeus um, says there are many problems that are very complex, but their solutions are really quite simple. 
And I would say, to start on a bright note, that the case of women in prison is one where the problem is very complex, but the solutions are really quite straightforward. And they are represented by some of the solutions we already have being provided by women specialist charities, in particular women's centres in the community where women can access a holistic range of support to deal with root causes of offending, including substance misuse, uh, mental health, domestic abuse, and some issues around debt and family relationships and so on in a safe women only environment where their problems can be dealt with supported by independent advocates who can help them access the services they need. And those simple solutions have been known for many, many years, um, particularly since the Causton inquiry recommended them as the linchpin really in a whole system response to women. And unfortunately, those systems have not been put in place in order to make that solution a reality for every woman in the country. And our, our hope is that one day, and one day hopefully sooner as a result of our work and the work of others than would otherwise be the case, that every woman in the country will have access to a women's centre like that. And that will be the first port of call um, when she becomes, if she unfortunately does, caught up in the criminal justice system rather than prison. So in terms of what we've been doing over the last few months to encourage that, there was three things I wanted to talk to you very briefly about. One is that we've been making the case for sustainable funding for women's centres and the Women's Budget Group has been a core partner in that. Um, and other women's centres that we work with, Anna Wim, Brighton Women's Centre, Together Women, there was a whole load of women's centres, many of you will know them, have all been working together to share our information with the Women's Budget Group and they have published a report only a month ago about how sustainable funding can be achieved through co-commissioning and avoiding the bureaucratic procurement um, systems, which we are currently wading our way through, that benefit very clearly large private companies or large generic charities and do not take account of the issues that are faced by specialist women's charities that provide incredibly excellent value for money and long-term solutions to problems, not short-term market-based um, solutions, as is sometimes the case with other large generic and private sector providers. And the second issue that we're dealing with, a very important strategic issue, which I know Paula um, would probably allude to when she speaks, and that's the fact that services like ours are there because people have often lost trust in the criminal justice system and in other state agencies. We work with women that have often been in the care system, a third of women in prison grew up in care and have lost trust in the state. And we provide independent services that are specifically not the police, they're not probation. And to draw services like ours in a counterproductive and harmful way into the punitive system and into enforcement, is something that we are really fighting at every turn and we want more attention to be paid to why it is that charities must remain independent and those in prison and in the community must have access to support that's independent advocacy um, and is not tied up with systems of punishment. And then I guess the third thing to talk about and to sort of end on really is about what we've been doing to build collaborations across women's centres and so since the first day of lockdown back in March the first week we've been meeting every week and sometimes there's 30 of us on a call and there Anna's there and there's others that are on these calls and we have been planning and collaborating sharing what works sharing plans writing I'm sure Lucy Fraser in particular would say too many minister ministerial letters but really flagging at every turn on the ground and what needs to be done to address those and that has been part of what we've been doing with other agencies as well, Appeal, PAS, across the board, Hibiscus, um, lots of organisations that we've been trying to work more closely with to build a collaborative approach to change and to really actually demonstrate the sort of model that we think will work. We don't think competition and forcing people into competition is the thing that works, it's collaboration and sharing and building alliances that we think is the way forward. And um, so that's where we're at. And from our point of view, I think that there's a lot to be said for um, for believing that change is possible. Um, and I think what we've shown collectively across women's centres and um, our partner agencies is our ability to survive and to thrive in the most difficult of circumstances. 
which is often actually what you find in prisons and in women's centres. When you get down into women's stories, you often leave with a sense of awe, really, that someone's been able to come out of a life of quite a lot of twists and turns and problems um, with such, such strength. Um, and so I wanted to leave you with a quote of um, Mayor Angelou. And she said, I've learned that you can tell a lot about a person by the way she handles three things, a rainy day, lost luggage and tangled Christmas tree lights. And now I know it's only November and I'm very much one for your Christmas decorations should not go up until December the 1st. I'm just putting that out there. But I did dig out the Christmas tree lights and the whole detangling thing is a nightmare. But what we have seen, I think, is that dealing with rainy days, lost luggage and tangled Christmas tree lights all at the same time um, has shown what the women's specialist sector can deliver despite all those issues that we face. And we think that it's about time that we were believed in and that the solutions to the problem of women in the criminal justice system was looked at in terms of the simple solutions that we set out um, to, to be provided across the country. So thanks, Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Kate, and for that sort of taking us on that kind of journey um, through those kind of practical issues that you're facing as an organization, the campaigning that you're doing, and then some of that sort of strategic thinking that's happening across the across the women's sector. Um, so that, that's really, really rich for us to sort of engage with and think about as a, as a group in our conversations. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask if um, Paula can join us. Yeah. Um, oh, hi, Paula. There you are. Wonderful. <laughs> I spotlight you and, and then, yeah, just hand, hand over to you. Okay, wicked. Um, it's been fabulous so far. Um, can I just say, Kate, um, that was fabulous to hear and just wanted to share with everybody that when I was a prisoner, uh, women in prison were the one of very few services that came into the prison and walked alongside the women in the jail didn't try to like preach didn't try to fix um actually like just i had really really fruitful relationships with the worker that came in and i always remember that as a model of how you should operate in a prison um that you shouldn't just try and be a savior <laughs> you need to just let people go at their own pace, but also give them the education to understand what's happening to them. Because one thing I've learned is that you can't know what you don't know. And so it's really hard to navigate out of a situation without guidance and signposts. And that is exactly what Women in Prison did for me. So I just wanna thank the organization for that, but also to acknowledge and validate that service and the independent nature of it, because that was so clear as well, that the lady who came in was slightly subversive and it really appealed to me. <laughs> I, I think we shouldn't forget that women in prison are not, you're always depicted as vulnerable, helpless individuals, but actually we have agency and we have like uh, narratives of resistance that might be subtle, but they're actually there. And uh, I think the whip worker, uh, Jane, her name was, who came to see me in Drake Hall really understood that. And I definitely remember her with a great deal of uh, affection. So just, um, just to introduce myself. Um, yeah, so Paula, I'm at the Prison Reform Trust and I'm leading the work there on prisoner involvement. And in this dire lockdown period, the double lockdown in prison, I call it, we've doubled down on listening because one thing in a building back better, as that's the big narrative of the moment, isn't it? Is that we shouldn't forget that if we only build on what we already know, we'll only replicate what we've always got. So actually in moments of uh, when we face adversity, it's good to stop and check yourself and, and, and listen deeply to the people that you're trying to support. So we've actually doubled down on listening at the PRT and I lead a project called the Prisoner Policy Network. It's uh, a network of over a thousand, roughly about a thousand prisoners. Um, probably about 10% of those are women. Um, and we are um, 
we connect with those women and, and those men in that network and family members. We're constantly communicating with them. I have uh, three other people in my team who correspond with though with prisoners all week, <laughs> every week. We have about 50 to 60 letters, um, emails and phone calls a week. And we tr connect with those people, listening deeply to what's going on, sharing uh, knowledge of what's going on our end and trying to cross the divide, the information divide, the communication divide that um, separates prisoners really sadly from the context and it equips them to contribute effectively into the criminal justice workforce. So part of my work is around the identification of people in prison um, who have the capacity and, and the will to become leaders in our sector because part of the challenge here in, in, in perspective um, in much of the discourse about prisoners mm -hmm. is that people who have lived it such as me are a rarity in the strategic influencing space and my 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 job my mission is to identify people who want to contribute to support them um, to create the scaffolding for that to happen and create the space in the workforce for that to happen because challenge to dominant discourse requires fresh perspectives and many of the, the human wisdom of the people who, have, who are living imprisonment is, um, is not present in much of the debate. So we have quite a lot of um, the power and privilege of those that do occupy the spaces to influence means that many times it's, it, it, it misses the mark in terms of innovation and progression. But that's an aside. <laughs> That's just my intro, actually. Um, I, I, I did prepare some slides and I um, just thought I'd let you know what we've been hearing from the women to whom we've been listening in our captive series. So hopefully I'll be able to share this screen now and it'll work and I'll find the presentation that I wanted to share. I think hopefully it'll come up. Is that it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's there, Paula. Can you see it? Can everybody see it? I, I, I always get this wrong, so I'm quite pleased I've done it. So this is the Prisoner Policy Network. I'll go through that. But what we've been doing under since March, um, we've been listening and we've been um, consulting with our network. We put out adverts on in, in Inside Times, which is the prison newspaper, Converse, National Prison Radio and Way Out TV to communicate with the wider prisoner population, but also um, specifically um, through our directly communicating with our network through email a prisoner, paying for the responses. And we've got a free post address and a free phone telephone number that's globally cleared on the prison PIN system so people can call us uh, at any time and leave messages. And as I said, I've got a team that works with me who communicate nonstop with people in prison. So what have we been hearing from women? We've been hearing that communication has been really poor um, in terms of trying to, for people in prison, women in prison, to understand what's actually been happening. Um, that they felt cut off from the, main, from the main world. They're not mentioned in the, we've been hearing, they're not mentioned in the press briefings. There's not much talk in the press about them. And remember, prisoners only really know what the world is saying through five channels, through five main TV channels and limited newspapers. So there's a quote there from Newhall, of a, you know, just let you read it for a second. So it just feels like in, the, in, in March, things were very chaotic. Administration of the prison service in terms of relationships with prisoners and family members sort of became, became overwhelmed. And there was just a general sense of commu co confusion. And that communication to prisoners about what is happening is still very, very hit and miss, according to what we're hearing from the women who are part of our network early release scheme that was lauded in April, which aimed to release up to 70 women by May um, HMOP. The inspectorate themselves found of the 120 women that had been considered, only two were released. It's been a disaster. And um, by the end of the June, 
just before the scheme was stopped, um, Lucy Fraser just announced, said that only six women and 16 women from mother and baby units had been released. I think that's pretty shocking. Family contact has been the absolute uh, biggest um, conversation piece in the communication that we're having with women. Release on temporary license has completely stopped since March. That means that women who had previously were eligible for childcare released, go home and see their children, um, they haven't been going out. People who were going out on town visits on a Saturday or a Sunday, those have stopped. These were all opportunities when women in prison could have had contact with their children. Resettlement leave, even prior to release, has stopped. Social visits stopped altogether in March. There was some renewal of um, visits in, in May and June, but those have again stopped now. When they were, um, when they started again, they were um, where visitors had to wear masks. Some children were, and some prisons children weren't allowed in um, at all. And there was no physical contact. Can you imagine how hard that was for children to not be able to hug their mom? How hard that was for a mom not to have to hug their child. And, um, you know, we're hearing that the alternative forms such as purple visits, that that's also been really difficult. Those are 30 minutes every month. The rollout was pretty slow. They are now in all women's prisons. But the uh, security software that's uh, part of the technology means that if children move, the, the call cuts out. People have to re-identify, re-log in. So, I mean, I personally had one of these visits um, last week and um, it, it moved, it cut out twice whilst I was on the call. <coughs> and we've been pressing uh, at Prisoners are asking us to press for more of these um, uh, video calls to, to, to up them from the 30 minutes a month. So that children at the moment have been seeing their mother in prison for 30 minutes a month, if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've heard that because it cuts out that the it's, it's up, children can't sit still for 30 minutes. That's ridiculous. And there's an actual disproportion in terms of equality impacts. You know, <clears throat> the lack of rottle for child contact, you know, is, is, is disproportionately affected women. It's a quote there from a woman in style. As Kate and the previous uh, speakers have talked about, you know, mental health is a massive issue. There's a quote there from a woman in um, Newhall, uh, mental health, massive issue here in prisons, and there is no duty of care for it. We are simply giving a colouring pack. Depression, anxiety, discomfort, boredom and comfort eating. The ladies are piling the white in. I feel I'm in the passenger seat of an out of control car and we're about to hit the brick wall. I don't think we can underestimate the impact of 23 and a half hours per day behind the door. Education providers have seemed to have disappeared. Um, we've had a lot of complaints, for instance, about the Open University, not mm -hmm. getting back to, uh, to women who are studying, lack of work, lack of association, limited exercise. And many unable to shower more than once every four days. We had a very distressing letter from a woman who had tested positive, who was uh, for COVID, who was then uh, quarantined for 14 days and wasn't able to use the showers with the rest of the women. And definitely a sense that um, the goodwill that there was in March has definitely dissipated. Um, very, very poor take up by women of the COVID testing opportunities. And I've had uh, letters today, um, a phone call today saying, if, we, if there's any vaccine going to be offered, we don't want to be the guinea pigs. So 
So, you know, there's a lot of confusion in prison about what is actually going to happen and um, what the vision for the future looks like. Self-harm rising in prison. We've had the um, notification of that. But we've also had some letters which say that some people feel better that they are alone because they haven't felt safe in the main community of a prison. So that woman saying, I've had women threaten me in front of officers and that they do nothing. So just in terms of another big issue now is, are women going to be staying longer in prison because of COVID? Rotter has stopped altogether, which really dramatically impacts on in release on temporary license, definitely impacts on your ability to transition through the gate to normalize your family relationships for not to become as quite so much of a shock when you are released. That has stopped. Can you imagine the shock if you've been in prison for a couple of years and then you suddenly get dropped off at the gate and told to get on with it? I remember how disorientating it was for me. And I had had opportunities to connect back with my family. There are people who are becoming really frustrated because they're stuck in open conditions and they haven't been out all the time that they've been there. For women who are serving long sentences, evidence of ability to, um, to, um, to go out of the gate and to come back out, to minimise risk is a very important component of going forward for parole. And there's a growing anxiety in the letters that we're receiving about um, when is this going to end? And is this going to have a significant impact on their release dates? These things are all adding up to a sense of tension within the prison. There's a quote there, I'll leave it up there for you to read from Downview um, just recently. Courses are not being facilitated with no news on when they will be. So it isn't just about Rossell, it's about whether or not you're taking the offending behaviour courses that are part of your sentence plan. So for women who are looking forward to coming home, lots and lots of anxiety, lots and lots of barriers apparently in the way and no communication as about how that's all going to change. Well, we are having lots and lots of letters about healthcare and it is going to feature as our next captive report is going we've had a captive report already on families and progression and parole and rottle and the next one to be published which will probably be next week is a really long one about the impact on healthcare um healthcare services have been minimal i mean welfare checks on wings um, and obviously nurses coming out to do checks on the wing is still happening. But uh, we've had letters about people having disrupted appointments with psychiatrists, uh, really poor access to, um, to CAMS workers. Just a sense of that everything's ground to a halt unless you have an emergency situation. It's from Downview in September. And we're still hearing, um, even though now um, um, PPE has been issued to staff, but we've had months of letters from prisoners saying that um, staff and prisoners who are out of are not wearing PPE. And a lack of a COVID testing strategy is worrying people. Worrying uh, and, and, and people are feeling like they're not trusting. I mean, Kate talked earlier about people already, you know, in the prison, women in the prison system, not having trust with statutory authorities. When you're there in your cell and you're looking at staff who are not um, social distancing, who are, but, but who are shouting at you to social distance, you do have to <laughs> question, you know, what is going on here? And I think that um, there's serious consequences in the terms of the confinement means that relationships between um, prisoners themselves, the peer support that people um, get from being around each other 
that has all now diminished and any and relationships with staff which are also part of what helps people to sustain themselves and to survive imprisonment is also damaged by such long-term restrictions on relationships building and, and cellular confinement so it's a really you know it's a sad story at the moment of anxiety depression and a sense of hopelessness and um, I, I actually fear for what's going to happen um, over Christmas in women's prisons. Um, and finally, just if people want to contact me, there's my email address. Thank you so much for that, Paula, and um, for that reminder of listening as a practice and the importance of listening as a practice. It was, uh, and you know, being able to share what came from that um, in your work and, 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 and sort of outline that environment that's been really, really um, detailed and, and, and thoughtful. So thank you for that. And thank you to all of our speakers for bringing the voices of women into the room with us today um, and, and really foregrounding those, those experiences for us. And um, what I'm gonna suggest now is that we um, again, move into kind of breakout groups just to kind of have a moment to reflect together um, on those, those, those three kind of talks that we've encountered there and, and, and reflect on what we feel maybe from our organizational or um, from our studying perspective, um, those, uh, are, are those urgent issues facing women in the criminal justice system in light of COVID-19. Um, but before I do that, I, I think I have this power on Zoom. I'm going to unmute you all and ask if we could just give um, a round of applause um, to our speakers for, for, for three brilliant contributions there. Well, um, and now I feel incredibly powerful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute you all again. Um, and then I'm going to pop you into breakout, group, breakout rooms to, again, ask you just to reflect on um, what we've heard from our speakers, but also maybe speak to your own um, institutional or individual perspective on what you feel the most important things facing women in the criminal justice system are in light of COVID-19 and then we'll come back together. So I'm just going to invite you to those rooms now. Um, and yeah, if you could if you could join a, a smaller conversation, that'd be great. I'm going to encourage us to move to the next section where we um, where we hear from Clean Break and also they are going to do a performance sharing for us. And then we'll have a kind of Q&A for all speakers, um, including Clean Break and the speakers that we heard from before the break um, at, at the end. So I'm going to start by introducing Clean Break and then I'm going to pass over to Anna, River and Yasmin. Um, Clean Break, for those of you who aren't familiar with their work, use theatre to keep the subject of women in prison on the cultural radar, helping to reveal the damage caused by the failures of the criminal justice system. Through their unique work, they raise difficult questions, inspire debate, and help to affect profound and positive change in the lives of women with experience from the criminal justice system. And we have uh, three speakers who are joining us who are all sort of slightly differently related to Clean Break today. So I'm just gonna introduce them um, and then pass over to them. So uh, Yasmin Joseph is a London-based writer. Her debut, Please Jovert, premiered at Theatre 503 in 2019, and she was nominated for the Evening Standard's Most Promising Playwright Award, and most recently won the 2020 James Black Tate Prize for Drama. Yasmin is the current writer in residence at Sister Pictures and is on attachment at the Royal Court Theatre as a winner of the Channel 4 Playwright Scheme. Yasmin is also under co-commission with the Soho Theatre and the Actors Touring Company as part of the Soho Six, the Place Theatre the Place Theatre in Bedford and with the retired Caribbean Nurse Association and Clean Break. River is a writer and director and theatre of the oppressed practitioner. In 2019, working within Clean Break's young woman's company, Brazen, River co-wrote the play Belong. Using theatre to address issues of injustice, River is especially interested in what role anger, mutual support and accountability might play in social change. 
Combining theatrical skills and academic research, River currently works as a research assistant at Centre for Society and Mental Health, King's College London. Uh, and Anna Herman is Joint Artistic Director of Theatre Company Clean Break and has been working in the field of theatre and social change for 30 years, specialising in theatre and education with marginalised groups in the UK and abroad. Between 2006 and 2018, Anna was trustee of Leap Confronting Conflict, a UK-based national charity specialising in youth and conflict. Anna was recently, in July 2020, elected as co-chair of the National Criminal Justice Arts Alliance. Uh, and they are joined today um, by two performers, Unique Spencer and Polly Frame. So I'm going to pass over to you, Anna River and Yasmin, uh, for the next section, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So the way that we're going to um, use our time is to, I'm going to do a bit of an overview and, and introduction to Clean Break and the work that we've been doing during COVID. And then I'm going to um, hand over to River and Yasmin to talk about the specific piece of work that they've been working with us on. Um, and then we'll conclude with a performance of that work, a kind of rehearsed reading of that work. Okay, is that all right? So thank you so much for inviting us here, Sarah. It's great to be here. It's lovely to um, yeah, be sharing and talking in this, in this way. Um, I feel profoundly moved by the presentations earlier. Actually, Kate always galvanizes me um, to get campaigning and, and feel our power, which is brilliant. But I also, that was very much accompanied by a, a kind of real, a way, real reality check with Paula um, uh, and, and Emma and a sense of hopelessness. But I suppose that's where, that is the reality, isn't it? Um, they have to hold those feelings as well. Um, and it leads me to uh, feeling slightly inadequate about what we do. It's interesting placing theatre and the arts in this moment in, in, in terms of that need and how we really um, legitimise it. I, 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 I'm interested in that. Um, so as Sarah said, normally we would be working in women's prisons, in women's centres and at our own studios in North London and on stages nationwide. However, in March 2020, in the moment that, uh, of lockdown, our first lockdown, our plans for main stage productions were halted as theatres across the country had to close their doors. And two projects that we were about to embark on in women's prisons um, were put on hold, as were visits of any nature, as we've heard. So in this moment, it was absolutely clear to us that our priority needed to be the urgent needs of our members. And our members are women with lived experience of the criminal justice system and women who are at risk of, of entering it with drug and alcohol or mental health needs. So we needed to respond to what was going on for our members who were in this moment were facing increased isolation, increased poverty, uh, potential relapses, heightened ex in incidents of domestic abuse and who had little outlet and limited support with a lot of services and certainly statutory services kind of not being very accessible in that moment and also little access to the virtual world. So um, there was a big issue for us with our building closed on how we would continue to support the 70 or so members who come to our building on a weekly basis. And uh, we, uh, we kind of acted urgently to get an online program of creative um, videos by female practitioners available and uh, uh, available for our members, offering a range of health and well-being, theatre and playwriting activities each week, which women could do on their own and in their own time. And in parallel with this, because of the kind of digital poverty that many of our members face, we were um, we bought laptops and data for members who had no access and have been since then an ongoing offering support um, to ensure that that women can can access support our services a lot of things that everything has now turned virtual so one of the benefits of the digital world that we um, were able to realize was the potential of others 
<laughs> to access our program in that moment. It didn't rely on people being in London, in North London, able to come to the building. So we shared the videos, the, our creative videos that we put online with our Women's Centre partners nationally, so that those in Newcastle, Brighton, Cornwall, wherever could also engage. And we got a lot of positive feedback from that as it was being shared by workers with their, with their clients. Uh, we moved all our therapy online and over the phone and we delivered our regular one-to-one -one support over the phone. Our small support team became incredibly stretched. Um, they are usually, but it was beyond recognition in this moment as the intensity of stories of no food in cupboards, relapses, as I said earlier, domestic violence incidents increasing and also mental health crises kind of surging. Um, emergency funding enabled us to grow the team temporarily and we also established a volunteer scheme called Creative Buddies which utilised the amazing network of our volunteers to connect weekly with some of our members to write together, create, talk and to reduce isolation. Artists who made up our wider community also saw the urgency of the need that we were meeting and they offered their time and support, enabling us to set up a programme of mentoring for our young artists across the months of lockdown. Polly, who's performing for you later today, was one of these artists and we're grateful to her for reaching out to us in that moment. Um, we're also part of a London wraparound service for women on probation across London boroughs, which is led by an organisation called Advanced Minerva in the North, East and West London boroughs and is led by women in prison in the South London boroughs. Mm -hmm. And as part of that programme, our artists would lead weekly sessions at women's centres delivered on Zoom. And we quickly learnt across the months what was needed to deliver safely in these circumstances. So with resources in place for our members and for women in the community, we equally recognised and wanted to do something for women serving prison sentences who, who remain at the heart of the company's mission. There were huge concerns about the 23 hours of lockdown that we've heard mentioned by Paula and Kate earlier and the separation from family. So we tried in our small way to do something, um, to do what we think we can do through the arts, which is to, to connect and to, um, to, to connect and to inspire hope and expression. And we worked in partnership with the charity called It's Not Your Birthday But. And in a two week period in May 2020, we ran a project called Right to Connect. And we called out across our social media channels, inviting women in the community to write messages of hope and inspiration to women in prison. And we delivered those messages and some beautiful artwork to over 200 women in HMP Downview, who in turn wrote their own messages in response, which we then distributed to women in the community. We couldn't meet any practical needs of women in prison in that moment, but we could offer the connection and care across prison walls that we aim to do. When COVID struck, our strong social mission simplified the decisions we made, but as well as responding to the needs of our members, we were only too aware that artists as well were losing their livelihoods, particularly those with no financial safety nets. Everyone felt vulnerable to the impact of COVID on their mental health, and it became clear that we needed to better consider the well-being of everyone in our community and to offer connection where we could. Two metres apart was our response to this need. The project paired together 12 playwrights with 12 artists from our members pool to connect digitally over three months to share ideas and to collaborate however they wanted to interpret that. Importantly, this was the only remit. There was no ex expectation to submit work. It was welcomed, but not required. It became clear to us through the project how important this offer of a creative collaborative space was without deadlines at a time of deep isolation, uncertainty and global anxiety. So River and Yasmin are here with us today. And as, I, as we said, they're two of the artists who collabor collaborated together during this period. And I'm delighted to hand over to them to share with you some of the process and the experience of being involved in this project. So over to you, River and Yasmin. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, amazing, so I'm Yasmin um, and I'm a playwright and I was working with River throughout the course of the process. River, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, yeah, hi, my name is River and uh, yeah, I was part of uh, Two Meters Apart with Yasmin. 
in the height of the lockdown. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you so much for all the passion and all the realness, what, what you just shared in the past hour and a half. Uh, yeah. It's really good to be here. A major call to action, actually. And I feel like what's been really powerful about it is that um, like we were talking about in one of the breakout rooms that nothing felt the need to kind of be packaged and presented in a way that was really solvable. It was good to look at the enormity of the issue and how things were broken structurally, like how deep some of those breaks are um, so that we can even think about how it can be solved. But we're going to talk you through our process um, in kind of three chapters. So essentially, we're going to talk about what we valued about our involvement in the process, how we work together, and then we're going to introduce our piece, which was what we, which was basically the culmination of this process. Um, so one of the first things that both River and I said that we really valued about this process was the idea that it was just, it was not outcome and output driven in a time where everybody else was kind of pushing you to work um, where things were business as usual. Um, and River, chime in at any point about, about your feelings um, with regards to that. But I think definitely, I think some theatres, their response um, was one of panic, of course, because things are so uncertain, um, but it was to kind of get as much content as they can from their artists and put as much out into the world as quickly as possible so that they could feel like they were responding to the time rather than responding to how people were feeling as human beings. And um, yeah, it was just a great time to meet a, a new artist and understand a bit more about River's process to get into River's brain and process the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And without, uh, and I think, yeah, so that, that kind of space to able to creatively express of whatever is happening, especially you were just trying to make sense of, of all these changes and, and noise on the social media, but also like quite a lot of uh, powerful things happening, like Black Lives Matter movement, um, discussions which were not happening, finally happening all over and and information suddenly is being shared very pointedly on social media instead of like cat pictures. Well, I, I do love cat pictures, but, but there was a time when everything was in upheaval and trying to pretend that everything is as usual, it, it was just a bit insane or making a lot of people feel insane. So having this space to meet someone and hear about their practice and what's important and process of not able of, of the difficulty of processing uh, and that turned into um, creative work that, that was really invaluable. Yeah, and I felt like what was really great about how we chose to use our space was, as Anna said, it was a very open remit um, and we definitely lent into that and we used it as a space to basically unpack everything that we'd absorbed in the weeks, um, in the weeks prior. And a lot of that was shaped by the Black Lives Matter move movement, um, women who are incarcerated and the response of the state. Um, and, but I think, yeah, we, we, it all kind of trickled back down to our work as artists and how we can find some way to make some kind of meaningful statement or something that's from the heart. It just needs to matter to both of us, um, a way to comment on all of these things that we'd absorbed. Um, so to move on to how we work together, it was basically a process of gathering lots of source materials. So reading magazines, reading articles, images, and then sharing them in one big Google document that we just kind of rage at once <laughs> every other couple of weeks once we sit down and have a chat and trying to pick out the strands or the things, just synthesizing all of the material, trying to find a way to work out what we wanted to say with um, all of these things that we'd gathered and, and what was lying underneath them. And there are a few things that kind of seemed to underline it. And it was one of the one of the key things that kind of became really apparent was oppression being something that was made more visible um, in this time. And this kind of lifting of a veil um, about all of these kind of problems, societal problems that we see, um, but have new, lots of different language and policies to kind of find ways to sugarcoat it when actually in this time when we're all kind of stripped back to uh, the barest bones of humanity, um, that rot is exposed. Um, and River, you have some other points as well about that. Yeah, I mean, as I said in the breakout room as well, there was a lot of talk about freedom and how our freedom was taken away by the lockdown. And we are trying to understand that um, how this kind of, uh, freedom being taken away is different from, for example, being incarcerated, how 
uh, your privilege is being restricted temporarily is very different than experiencing oppression with its complexity and uh, with its long-term trajectory. Um, yeah, so we were trying to figure out of like, you know, who we should write for, or how can we write for ourselves in these complex times? And no, of our ideas were came up like I don't know, maybe a horse. We're gonna be a horse at the research um, at at the um, Black Lives Matter protest, where which is being interrogated by a police um, officer, or maybe we are an object. Maybe we are, and so we are. That's how it started kind of figure out where where our kind of journey is going to take us and right? I think, yeah and I think a big part of our thinking was in this moment a lot of a key thing that's been coming up from all of the talkers and speakers that came before us was about listening and us feeling that we didn't want to yes um be your artistic approach to problems in the world is a valid way of processing the noise and is a statement it is political active actually there is a privilege in being able to do that and that isn't the same as doing and being on the ground and being able to make a tangible difference in people's lives. So we were very aware of like the privilege in our pro process and the distance we had from women who were actually physically incarcerated at that time. And because of that, we've decided to find ways to kind of abstract our work and remove it even further so that we could actually try and capture, capture some degree of truth or honesty about just the atmosphere of, of, of what people are living through at this time. Um, and there was an article that we found about um, people, um, prisoners or people who had experienced um, presented COVID symptoms who weren't allowed access to showers. And then it spoke back to this idea of privilege and depression and all of these ideas just kind of being um, presented us to, to, to us in a really clear way in this time. And this idea that people are outside kind of trying to chant for haircuts whilst people are being denied a really, really basic human right and all of the many ways in which people's humanity have kind of been chipped away at and um, people being dehumanized by the response to COVID-19 in prisons. So we had the idea of writing from the perspective of a shower, um, of two from two showers um, that were in a prison and um, in the absence of women um, and understanding the shower's role in the structural rock within the prison that it stood. Um, River, do you have any other things to add about that? Oh, yeah, and what you were saying as well before about how COVID um, and Black Lives Matter highlighted all the structural complexities around this idea of crime or violence. I think it, it was quite important that to, to look at how why it's usually very individualized in mainstream media or who commits a crime or who is being violent actually there is a lot to do with people's silences and communities being complicit in a culture of enabling and allowing these things to happen and and how that that is never talked about and how this kind of being complicit to all these horrible harm is being done to us and to others is, is often kind of sidelined and really kind of made into black and white polarized into um, bad and good and crime and, and innocence. Um, and I think that's as well with, around violence and how, um, who gets to say who, who is violent and who gets to say that they are just doing something good for the people and they are, and yeah. You will see it's just a fragment of, of our idea and a fragment of our play. So it might not tell the whole narrative and not give all the details. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have anything to say about yeah, that. Yeah, I think the only other, sorry, there's a fly that desperately wants to be featured. <laughs> <laughs> like if you see it, I'm having my Mike Pence moment. Um, oh, not him. But um, yeah, basically, this is what we're about to share is a culmination of this process. There's a version of of this that would exist if we had a year to work on it and more of our glorious conversations. But what we're about to present with is basically a summation of the process, and um, that isn't to apologise for it. I feel like it's a really great way of of, of um, capturing all of the, inf the information and material we gathered and the way our two minds work separately and together. Um, but it's definitely a comment on, on the times in terms of, yeah, what we found about people being denied access to really, really basic necessities and the privilege that we're unaware of that we even have um, sitting at home whilst we're complaining about lockdown. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much everything from us.
Great. Great. Thank you, Yasmin and River. That was great to, to hear a little bit inside of your process. Absolutely. So we're going to um, move over to the performers. So I don't know, Sarah, I'm just going to introduce, I'm just going to set up a, a kind of stage direction when we start, but um, should we all turn our cameras off and... Yes, if we could or turn you our pin them. them. You do, you pin them, don't you? And I'm going to pin them. So just like unique, I've pinned you. So and I, and I, and I'll just pin Polly now. And then if we could turn our cameras off, that would be really excellent. Thank you. We are in the peak of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Many women in prisons are being forced to self isolate in conditions that have left them with limited access to showers for weeks. Showers one and two, sit and wait. Right. I think there's been a real loss of order here a real disconnect in the natural order of things. I'm feeling very shut out. No answers. Just sitting here, waiting. And I'm not even entirely sure what for anymore. No regard for what I do, for the balance I restore. Just second-hand whispers of disaster and its impending arrival, its ability to slip through the gaps, dance in the air, and the spiralling panic of paper in response. When I first arrived, the room they put us in was cold. Pale green tiles with rims coloured by bleach and mould. Cacophony of dripping water. Anxious gulps echoing through all of us. We waited alert. Strange noises, dozens of beats, high-pitched noises of human sort. And there, she moved across the room with haste, her half-smile flickering to the dim room, peeling her layers off. She unhid herself from the fabric and approached me with a widening grin. She stepped in front of me and said, hello, beauty. And I felt beautiful. I showered her with everything I had, with compliments and streams of joy. I gathered all of my warmth to fill the air with the swirling, silky particles of mine. And we played, we danced, we caressed, and we made bubbles. Big bubbles, small bubbles, and tiny, tiny bubbles that only two of us knew about. Tracy. This isn't easy work, you know. Pressed and sapped for energy at will. Human after human, each offering their bodies to me and the pressure, the pressure of that promise of needing to shape her day, of being a source of peace, healing, routine, humanity, of doing my best but not being able to resist the lime scale and jittery flow from cut corners and budgets. Then it's my fault. Then it's, this shower's shit. What a shithole, I fucking hate this shithole. Kicks and knocks and thuds and this usually helps. And now nothing. The days are getting hotter. The days are getting slower. They all stop coming. The women, the bubbles. I'm counting the drops of water so I can keep track of time. I longed for just five minutes just to tell her, to tell Tracy that I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't want this. I'm not like part of this, you know? Like 
I don't have a choice, you know? Like I was bought here. I was screwed over, fixed to the wall. I couldn't possibly move. What does she expect me to do? I often think about the vital role I play in the ecology of this place. The underling bottom of the food chain, but the most required. Washing away sin, cleansing the sweat of unjust labor, blood swirling around the drains. Quick, quick, be gone. Sanitizing history and drowning women's cries. I wish I was a river. It was about three weeks before I saw Tracy again. She was in the rush. The layers of her fabric she wrapped herself in was soaked with sweat. My pipes expanded in confusion, infused expectation when she stepped in front of me. She looked at me accusingly and I tried to open up, but this tension, this tension held me tight. Something inside of me just broke and I was blocked, gagged. There was nothing I could say to her. Rust settled in my mouth and I tried to empty whatever water was left in me. But I wouldn't taste any different. I want to be a real river. Somewhere where the sun shows that my water's crystal clear and the palm trees shake to make a ceremony of my steady flow. Like where I hear her describe sometimes when she mourns for home or the memories that I see so many whisper and commune around like sisters. Women would use me to wash their clothes and children would play and I don't know where the men are. I rarely hear they're mentioned. I don't think they'd come to my river. I think my water would be on their toes. How can you contain a thing that no one owns? People and their bodies? Water? Trapped in pipes, leased and withdrawn at will? No. No. A river will flow here tonight. A river will flow here tonight because I said so. And the women will dance in it as it slips beneath their doors. The ripples from their pounding feet making music loud enough to make the officials step away from their screens and look them in the eye. A river will flow here tonight and the women will dance. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that, Polly and Unique and River and Yasmin. To close, um, I am uh, just so grateful that you were all able to join us um, today and, and share those uh, rich and diverse and important perspectives with us. Um, so that thank you so much for, for sharing your work with us and, 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 and inspiring us all, I'm sure, among the audience as well, uh, to do more and, 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 and sort of engage in the, the grassroots activism that Kiva is talking about. Um, as we mentioned at the very start, this um, seminar is one in a series of seminars um, which continue throughout next year. So we will be undertaking more seminars with our partners at different universities that will continue to look at issues that orbit women in prison um, and women engaging in creative acts. Um, who have experience with the criminal justice system. So we're really looking forward to continuing those conversations with partners. Um, but yes, all that remains is for me to do my final unmuting uh, extravaganza and for us to just give a final round of applause to all of our um, panelists. Thank you.